the Harvard Medical School Brigham Osher Center. Before getting started with this program, I wanted to remind those of you who are requesting CME credits to please see our post on oshercenter.org for email request instructions. Also, a little bit about the structure of our, um, of our presentation today. Uh, we will allow all the presenters to present straight through uh, without any questions and answers during their talk. Everyone will be muted except the presenters. But we really encourage you to use the Q&A feature as the talk is going to start to load your questions on there. And I'll curate these questions um, and then uh, facilitate a discussion towards the end of the presentation. So it's now my great pleasure to introduce our distinguished lead guest speaker today, who's also a friend and a colleague. Dr. Ruth Bolver is a recognized leader in the field of health coaching. And today, along with her colleagues, she'll be sharing some pioneering work regarding the integration of health coaching training into the education of medical students. Dr. Wolver is director of the Vanderbilt Health, of Vanderbilt Health Coaching, and she also is the interim director of the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine based at Vanderbilt University. She's a professor of physical medicine and rehabilitation at Vanderbilt with a secondary appointment in the School of Nursing and an adjunct appointment at Mahari Medical College. Ruth is also the founding, a founding member and was an inaugural president of the National Board of Health and Wellness Coaching. A clinical health psychologist and nationally board certified health and wellness coach, Ruth has over 25 years of training experience uh, and mentoring um, in medical and allied health professionals in behavioral health, emotional health, and health coaching. Her research has been funded by the National Institutes of Health, um, the US Air Force, Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services. Her co-presenters who Ruth will introduce during the presentation include Mark Dreyzicki, pardon me for getting the, um, <laughs> I was coached before, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm gonna mess it up. Salam Boss, um, Kimberly Wichi Etheridge, and Regina Ofidele. So without further ado, I'm going to pass over the podium to Ruth, and I'm sure you're all going to join me in, in warmly welcoming her, her virtually. So thank you, Ruth. Thank you so much, Peter. And see, we just like to do this game where we give names that are hard to pronounce to people and then see, see what happens. It's like always a fun way to start. <laughs> so I'm really delighted to be here um, with my colleagues talking about the Meharry Vanderbilt Health Coaching program and what we've been learning from training first-year medical students. These are my disclosures, <clears throat> excuse me, and I will say that um, there's nothing that directly of these things impacts um, or changes the presentation. So I'm going to provide you some background on the program. Um, some of the science behind the way that we teach the program, and then some data on student perspectives. Um, my colleagues are going to help to expand that uh, by providing different perspectives, and I'll tell you what they're going to share when they step forward. And then finally, we'll leave some time for questions. So in case you're not aware of it, Meharry Medical College is an HBCU in Nashville, Tennessee, was founded in 1876, and it's the nation's largest nonprofit, historically black academic health center, dedicated solely to educating minority and other health professionals. It is the second largest educator of black and African American physicians in the US. <clears throat> and um, as of the 70s, together, Howard and Meharry, um, trained 83% of the Black and African American physicians in this country, so a huge producer. Um, it was ranked one of five top producers of primary care docs, and it is the highest producer of Black and African American PhDs in the biomedical sciences. Mary's mission includes empathy for the disadvantaged, as well as education in health sciences and the maintenance of a center for excellence for the practice and the delivery of healthcare. And indeed, it's estimated that about three quarters of the graduates go back 
to work with the disadvantaged. The motto for Meharry is worship of God <clears throat> through service to mankind. Great, so let's get on the same page about what this training program um, is. So I run the program, as Peter said, um, on health coaching at Vanderbilt. And what um, had happened in 2013 is I published with some colleagues a Prisma Guided Systematic Review um, to show how health coaching was operationalized in the peer-reviewed literature. So I want us all to get on the same page of actually what the definition of health coaching is. And these are six of the key elements of it. It's patient-centered, using the Institute of Medicine definition. Patients have input and determine their goals. Self-discovery is a key process. Um, developing systems of accountability, content education. And it all happens within a consistent relationship. So this is the definition that's also used by the National Board for Health and Wellness Coaching. It came out of the peer review, uh, the systematic review of peer reviewed literature. And it's a patient-centered approach where patients at least partially determine their goals and they themselves use self-discovery and active learning processes together with education to work towards their goals, to self-monitor behaviors, to increase accountability, and it all happens within the context of a relationship. The coach is a healthcare professional who's also trained in behavior change techniques and motivational strategies and excuse me, myriad communication techniques to help patients develop intrinsic motivation and get skills to create sustainable change for themselves. So this is what coaching is. And I just want to be clear from the get-go, coaches don't diagnose, coaches don't treat. What coaches do is elicit from patients um, what they're most interested in changing and helping to link what they need to change to what they most care about. Now, at the same time that we put that systematic review out, there, um, Ann King and a colleague from the National Board of Medical Examiners put out a review that showed the best practices for patient-centered communication in medical encounters. And there were specific communication skills that emerged from this, and they grouped into basically six functions. Those functions are fostering healing relationships, gathering information, providing information to patients, decision-making, and enabling disease and treatment-related behavior, as well as responding to emotions, I should say appropriately to emotions. <laughs> So what I wanna show you over the next six slides, I don't want you to get lost in the, the details of it, <clears throat> but I want you, excuse me, just to note all of the things that are in red here are skills that are trained in our Vanderbilt Health Coaching Program. And those that are in maroon are skills that are partially taught in the program. So function one, foster healing relationships, for example, the skills that physicians need are also part of the health coach training program. Oh, I'm so sorry, I forgot to take off animation. But you get the idea here. The vast majority of the skills needed to gather information taught through a health coaching program. A number of the skills that are needed through providing information also taught. The only thing that's not is um, nature of specific illnesses and approach to diagnoses, because again, coaches don't diagnose. Decision making, a number of the skills in this function also taught in health coaching. Enabling disease related and treatment related behavior. Um, some, most of the skills are taught in health coaching, but not things like um, assessing patient capacities and um, enacting particular treatments. And finally, responding to emotions. Health coaching teaches and trains in these core skills that are also part of best practice patient-centered communication for physicians. So a little less than three years ago, um, an associate dean, Suzanne Tropez-Sems, reached out to me um, 
she is at Meharry, she's recently retired, um, and was interested in developing or exploring a partnership to see if training the first year medical students in health coaching could give them a really solid foundation for patient-centered communication. Um, Harry licenses the curriculum and has been integrating it into their medical curriculum over the last three years. One of the unique things they did is also have a number of faculty trained so that we can jointly deliver the program. And this is with an eye towards sustainability. So over the last three years, we have trained 368 medical students from the very beginning of their training. So this is one of the very first things they get. I meet them actually on day two um, after they've been oriented to where things are. The um, curriculum itself, we're continuing to iterate based upon feedback from the students and feedback from the faculty on what they're observing. In 2018, our first launch, we did a six week program. It involved 132 contact hours in addition to reading and practicing skills. In 2019, we elongated that to 12 weeks so the students would have a longer time to integrate the practice, but left the content pretty much the same. And this past year, we condensed it to 10 weeks and took a significant piece of the contact um, of the modules away. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about, uh, about that in a moment. So we continue to improve it based upon feedback from the students. So the aims of the program are to provide a solid foundation, patient-centered communication, but also to help the medical students understand and be able to utilize the basics of empowering patients, empowering patients to be activated in their own healthcare and in their own sustainable behavior change. Another unique thing about this is that it immediately engages medical students in an allowable interpersonal healthcare role where they have direct patient contact. So as opposed to having to wait till their second or more commonly third year to actually have a one-on-one -on -one client interactions or patient interactions, they begin doing this right out the gate. And finally, the last aim of the program was to help students manage their own goal setting and establish self-care routines that could support them in medical school. So the teaching methodology that we use is the flipped classroom. And this um, approach basically gives students first exposure to content outside of the classroom. So they watch recorded presentations, do reading on their own. We have a Moodle-based platform that they work from. And there are also activities um, embedded in it to engage them in more active learning. So personal reflections, exercises with discussion boards to process the exercises, quizzes, et cetera. This um, methodology, the flipped classroom, in essence uses comprehension and gaining knowledge as it uses the approach of comprehension and gaining knowledge as things that happen before the students are actually in the classroom. And then when they're in the classroom, that's the time for the higher level cognitive skills. This approach is very much based on cognitive psychology. And so once they're um, together in the classroom, which is now a virtual classroom, um, that's when they're able to actually develop application and analysis and synthesis skills. And very importantly for coaching, skills acquisition. So knowledge, hugely important, skill acquisition on top, um, much more demanding. One of my favorite studies of the flipped classroom, if you're not familiar with this approach, um, came out of Wieman's, or I don't know if it's Wieman or Wyman's work. And what they did was take two large physics sections. They ran them normally for the first 11 weeks of the semester. And then the 12th week of the semester, they had one group do a three hour traditional lecture. The other group did a flipped classroom. And what they found is that uh, trained observers who were rating the students 
assessed a 45% engagement, 45% of the students were engaged in the traditional lecture, whereas 85% were engaged in the flipped classroom. But this also translated to knowledge. When they took a multiple choice test, 71%, I believe it was seven, I'm sorry, 41% um, <clears throat> was the score on average for the people that were in the traditional classroom, 74% on average for those that were in the flipped classroom. So this is a two and a half standard deviation effect size. Really significant difference from a very minor shift in the methodology. So our approach, um, in essence, maximizes first exposure and what the students can get in terms of knowledge and comprehension prior to actually uh, coming into the classroom. Just to give you a little data on the student's report of that first phase, that gaining knowledge and comprehension, pre and post each of the modules that they take online, um, they're, they're asked their understanding of a given concept that is um, taught in that given module. And their reported increase in understanding ranges from 1.3 to 1.9 points per module. This is on a five point scale. So this is an average increase of one and a half points. Again, a pretty significant effect size is self-report. It's early data because we're just learning about how to institute this. Um, but we were very pleased with this finding. So we're going to spend the rest of our time actually talking about the flipped classroom, the experiential learning piece, um, and what happens as students engage those higher levels of cognitive workload. So our small groups are in um, not, uh, are of nine people, and that's made up of three triads. We're going to talk more about those triads in a minute. Students do what's called a personal change project across the course. Um, and um, one, of our, one of our students is here is gonna present his personal change project to you so you understand what it is that they're doing. At the end of the course, the students actually have a practical skills exam using a standardized patient in the simulation lab, which is very unique for health coaching. I'm not aware of other health coaching programs doing this. And after the course is finished, um, the students go on to a practicum where they do 15 sessions with at least three clients across the first year. So they start getting one-on-one -on -one exposure, um, could be telephonically, could be in person, not in 2020, but <laughs> prior to that. So let me talk a little more about the triad. So the triad serves so many different functions. The um, Center for Educational Development and Support at Meharry tests students before they come on their analytical reasoning skills, their learning styles, learning preferences, um, their Myers-Briggs, and they go through a process of organizing the students into triads so that the extroverts and the introverts, for example, are mixed up so that there are males and females together in groups. So people with very diverse learning styles are put together in the triads. People with different kinds of um, analytical reasoning strengths put together in triads. And it's very intentional how the triads are created. And then it is through the triad that the person, that the student does their personal change project. So within the triad, the student acts as a client for one series, as a coach, for another and as the observer. So they'll meet for an individual triad practice and they'll basically have three sessions. And in that practice, they'll get to be client, coach, and observer, all three for the three different sessions. So as the client, they're of course learning firsthand. So experiential learning about what it's like to actually change behavior and all of the obstacles that can arise and how, that, uh, how to work with that. At the same time, they're recognizing the impact of a number of interpersonal skills as the coach is practicing using them. The coach, of course, is practicing using the skills and using the skills in different um, formations, depending on which session, what kind of session, what kind of coaching session it is. 
And then the observer's role is also extremely important because initially what the observer is doing is recognizing when specific skills are being used. But by the end, the observers have developed enough skill that they're actually evaluating and giving feedback. Um, they practice this from day one. And so they're, that's demanding an even on Bloom's taxonomy and a high uh, cognitive workload here. The other cool thing about the observation role is that uh, we train people in particular ways to give feedback and it involves giving acknowledgements for very specific things that are observed as well as suggestions for what skills to enhance. So the triads form a really nice learning community where they're working together in these three roles across the course. The course objectives are basically to demonstrate by the end of the course relational skills that promote a growth fostering relationship. So this is things like cultivating presence, using silence, active listening, reflection, summarizing, acknowledging, etc. The second objective is to demonstrate, be able to demonstrate practices and skills that promote self-discovery and build autonomy in the, in the patients. And so those are things like visualization, mindfulness, asking open-ended questions, linking personal values to change, um, strengths assessment, and leveraging personal strengths. They also learn to do this from a holistic paradigm. So this is just a pictograph of our, what we call our wheel of health. It's our um, multi-domain, uh, our way of looking at an individual's life. And the students learn to guide self-assessment through this. Compassionate awareness is at the center of the wheel. And then there are eight particular areas um, where people are invited to um, further explore for where they'd like to make change. Also, the medical students learn to do the assessment and think in this more broad holistic way, and then to apply very specific behavior change theories from this paradigm. Many of these skills, of course, come out of motivational interviewing, but they also learn to do a full follow-up health coaching session. And then importantly, they began to um, identify which skills can be used in clinical encounters going forward. We attend to structural and co cultural competence as well, and evidence-based recommendations for nutrition, sleep, and exercise. So I just briefly want to tell you that in our assessment of the program, in the first three years, we're really focused on feasibility and acceptability, getting a lot of information back from the students and using that to iterate and refine the curriculum. The original plan for a hard outcome was the pass rate on first take of the step two clinical skills, which would happen in spring for those students that we trained in the first year. Given, of course, the state of the world with the pandemic, um, it's unclear whether this is actually going to happen. Uh, MBME has postponed step two clinical skills testing for um, 12 to 18 months. So we are, um, need to figure out exactly how we're going to do this um, for, a, for harder outcomes. Um, but we have two more years to be able to do some more robust evaluation. We also have lots of observation data um, that we've yet had a chance to analyze. I just briefly want to show you based on student perceptions. <clears throat> we just finished the third class and haven't analyzed their data yet. So this was from the year before. Um, but we, uh, in essence, when students measure themselves pre and post on how effective they feel, uh, how confident they feel in their effectiveness at doing certain things. When we ask about different kinds of reflections, whether they're able to pick up the meaning behind something or the emotion behind something, we see a significant increase. When um, we ask them about using open-ended questions for various things, whether it be eliciting a patient's perspective or moving a patient toward action or helping them deal with ambivalence, significant increases across the board. They feel more confident in helping people set goals and more importantly, 
moving toward those goals step by step. And then they learn and feel more confident in their ability to elicit motivation to lead a patient toward gaining insight, to help the patients identify values and link them to goals. And <clears throat> finally, to promote autonomy in patients, eliciting the solutions from the patients and helping patients to learn about their own process. So I'd like to stop here and hand the stage over to my buddy, Mark Droisica. That's it's a German, Droisica. <laughs> um, Mark is a trainer and consultant in integrative medicine and health coaching, as well as mindfulness. He graduated from Duke School of Medicine where he completed coach training and he also completed the coach training at Vanderbilt. Um, he's very active in the national board certification for health and wellness coaching and has been one of the lead trainers for the Veterans um, Affairs Office of Patient-Centered Care and Cultural Transformation. So Mark is going to share a little bit about his perspective as a trainer and as a former student. Thank you, Mark. All right, and thank you, Dr. Wolliver, and good morning, everyone. So now that Dr. Wolliver shared an overview and some preliminary data, I will pivot a bit here and share just a brief personal story of my introduction to coaching. So when I first attended my first coach training program, I was just finishing medical school and really wanted to cultivate this new skill set to help people change their behaviors. Um, in short, I was ready to learn to tell people what to do. And you know, to my dismay, I soon discovered that the foundation of coaching was listening. So imagine my confusion when the first week of training was spent time on skills of presence, and reflecting, you know, for example, learning that when a patient shares their struggle, you might just listen with empathy and simply respond, yeah, it sounds like you're really struggling, that, that must be hard, say more. And again, just finishing up medical school, I can tell you this type of conversation was totally unfamiliar to me and frankly felt completely, you know, ridiculous almost. I basically said, you know, okay, I get, I get coaching, um, it's not what I, what I thought it was. I can see how it might be beneficial, but it's certainly not my thing. You know, I would rather just tell people what to do. Um, but I did want my coaching certificate. So, you know, I basically figured out that whatever my instinct was in these conversations, as Dr. Wolliver described, these triad practices, you know, I discovered for me, coaching meant just doing the total opposite of what my instinct was. You know, when I noticed the impulse to offer advice, um, I would ask instead, you know, what, what ideas do you have? You know, when I had the urge to interrupt, I would maybe just maintain eye contact, nod, you know, maybe offer an empathic reflection. Um, again, I cannot emphasize enough how completely foreign and even comical, you know, all of this felt to me. And the most I think memorable part, oh, I see Salone down there nodding his head, maybe having a, a similar experience. Um, I know for me, you know, the most memorable part then of the training was, you know, one day after practicing, again, this, this absurd new skill of listening with my classmates. You know, one of them that I had just coached came up to me during a break and said, you know, Mark, I, I just have to say thanks. You know, I know that we were just practicing, but you, you really helped me realize some things that I hadn't thought about. And I basically responded, you know, is, is that a joke? How, how did I help you realize something? I didn't, I didn't tell you anything. I, I just listened and you know, reflected what you had said. And then, um, you know, I mean, the next day it happened again. One of my classmates actually called me on her drive home and said, you know, I, I really just keep thinking about our conversation today and you, you just, you helped me so much. You really seem to get this coaching thing. You, sh you should consider doing this. So y'all, this became one of the, those um, life-changing moments for me, I think. You know, how could it be after years of learning how to prescribe meds, tell people what to do, you know, that I was finally discovering the, the art of medicine through the skill of listening. So suffice it to say that began what took me probably years of practice to unlearn old habits. In fact, I'll say I'm, I'm still learning, I'm still practicing, and truly, you know, rewiring my brain to listen. 
And I think the take home here is that while many of us may think that we're listening, you know, listening might just be a, a learned skill that takes intention and training and practice, you know. So, you know, now that I've shared with the experience of training as a coach feels like from the coach's perspective, I really just want to emphasize on the slide here that the, the real aha moment often comes for students when they experience coaching from the perspective of the patient. You know, as Dr. Wolliver explained, what makes our training model so unique is all that, that time spent in the triad practices where you have the opportunity to be coached by a classmate. And you know, what's so impactful about that experience is recognizing what it feels like to be listened to. So you know, even just to you know, pause here for just a moment um, and ask, you know, how, how often do you all in, in your life feel like you are truly being listened to? You know, what is it like when someone gives you their, their full attention? And you know, the point is that we all, we all recognize that feeling and we rarely experience that feeling of being listened to in healthcare. And this is something our students get to experience within their first weeks of medical school. You know, for example, what does it feel like when I can share vulnerable information with a doctor or in our case, you know, my, my classmate who I really trust. And, you know, during these triad practices is when students actually give each other feedback on this. You know, they'll say, you know, it, it, it felt really, really good when you validated that I put a lot of effort into this goal. Um, or on the flip side, they'll say, you know, listen, man, you didn't make eye contact with me once that entire conversation. And, you know, you kept telling me things I should do and you didn't even ask what I thought. And so again, what an amazing opportunity for student doctors to get this feedback in their first weeks of training. And so speaking of feedback, we have a slide here that, you know, every year we get lots of program feedback that illustrates this. Our first slide just shows some qualitative data we've received. So I'll invite you all to read through these comments, which really highlight the impact of learning to listen. Again, such an obvious skill that ironically, you know, very few of us are actually receiving formal training around. And the next slide also points to some more examples of students discovering the impact of learning how to listen. And then finally, our last slide, again, shows some clear evidence that students are making that connection between learning how to listen and motivating and empowering their patients to make changes. So at this point, thank you all for, for listening. <laughs> and I will turn it back to Dr. Wollinger. Thanks so much, Mark. Now I want to invite Solon Bass to present. Solon's a first year medical student at Meharry. He's from the Seattle area where he lives with his wife and their two daughters. Solon was in the Navy for six years as a hospital corpsman, and that's really where he developed his passion for healthcare. He then was a respiratory therapist for eight years before returning to school. He graduated from Seattle Pacific University with a degree in chemistry. And what he's gonna to talk to you about today is the Personal Change Project. So all of the students in the health coaching course um, do a Personal Change Project, which basically culminates in a presentation of their own behavior change journey. So they go through the process of um, having and developing a personal vision and exploring sources of intrinsic motivation. They set an umbrella goal or a target goal for the duration of the course. It was six weeks or 10 weeks or 12 weeks. They um, do action steps. This is all with their triad. And so they're being coached week to week by their peer, um, action steps that are integral to their change process and in essence, they share what insights emerged for them. We also have them stage themselves on the trans theoretical model on the initial stage where they were at the beginning and the end in terms of uh, the behaviors they choose for their un umbrella goal. And then we have them apply at least two behavioral change theories so that they can talk about where that theory was evident in their own course. Um, and then they share how it's informed their own learning process. So, Solon, let me turn it over to you. 
Okay, so this is the um, start of my health journey. Um, and I, I use real pictures from, from my life to, to do it because it is a personal health journey. Uh, this one shows me kind of blurry and in the bushes uh, going down a path because that's where I felt like I started. I didn't exactly know what I was doing, but I knew I was going somewhere. Um, the, on the next slide, we, uh, we start looking into to the self-assessment. Self uh, where we use that trans theoretical model and the wheel of health. And uh, I, I had my areas of contemplation where I was like, oh yeah, I could probably change those things, which was like sleep and rest, movement and exercise and environment. Um, and then I had my areas where I was in pre-contemplation where it's like, yeah, I probably should, but I'm not going to, um, which is uh, self-awareness, mind-body connection. Um, and then, then I was able to also evaluate my own strengths and uh, values, which were things like ethos, empathy, teamwork, kindness, honesty, loyalty, and compassion were those, those pieces. Um, as you can see, this was like hanging up the shelf like I'm doing right there um, to, to reach for kind of further success. And my daughter, who's kind of like, like a little piece of myself, is evaluating my work there. So that's why we got that, that going. So. Next page. Um, in my vision, um, which, you know, this is, it's funny because Dr. Kim's here and she kind of helped me set this vision in the earliest stages. Um, I saw myself walking on a beach on a sunny day. I decided to leave behind stress in my life and I brought my family with me. Uh, when I started the vision exercise, it felt like everything was cloudy, but as I got closer to where I wanted to be, it all became kind of more clear. Um, I, I knew that I had to get rid of some of that stress, in other words, and I knew I had to bring my family with me, which was, which was a good thing. It's very much as this picture uh, depicts, depict is kind of where my vision's at. Uh, yeah, that led me to my umbrella goals. So, so I have two pictures there for my umbrella goals and my two girls because I got two different umbrella goals that kind of occurred throughout the process where I had to change. Um, originally, my umbrella goal was just to reduce the stress in my life through through committing myself to activity and rest, in which I found that I couldn't fully control in some spots, but we'll talk about that a little bit later in the step process here. Um, but then as I kind of kind of grew, I was able to smart up the goal using that kind of a lock sort of method of a, of a smart goal there and uh, the help from the instructors to make it a five times, times a week, 30 minutes a day smart goal. So uh, next slide. Okay, so the original goal, um, goal. So the only way to get a thing done is to start to do it, then keep doing it, and finally you'll finish it. That's Langston Hughes who stated that, um, which is like the tiny steps that you take, take in this process that kind of build your uh, self-determination and your, your efficacy. So my, my first goals were the very tiny steps of Setting an alarm two times times a week, not for waking up, but really for sleeping and um, and sleep hygiene and learning a lot about sleep hygiene. Um, that goal expanded uh, within the next week to five times a week, um, and then I was able to have conversation with my wife even about sleep hygiene. Unfortunately, I there were some things that weren't within my own control, which were the uh, the two stumbling blocks on the staircase there, which are my two two daughters, you know. One of them got in teeth one night and she would not go to sleep. And uh, I realized I had to switch goals. So that brings me to my next, um, there we go. Uh, so, so my goals had to change to something more controllable, which was movement um, and activity, which, which I found as, as a good goal. It, it started off with me just doing kind of like, like calisthenic exercises, working out push-ups, sit-ups, uh, going for walks. Walks. And then I realized, oh man, I can use this to kind of play with my daughters. So, so it turned into a little bit of yoga, a little bit of dance parties, a little bit of fun night cases. And it even got expanded more when, when my wife realized, hey, you should be using this to do some chores around the house. So I was able to help change my environment too, which um, was also effective. So we put in a wood floor, we redid a bathroom, um, a lace project, we put in a, put in a wall, we painted. It's, it's going along pretty good. So 
So I've been continuing down this one. So let's go to the next slide. So here's my daughter, daughter Uni showing a reflection of a picture of me there. Um, and uh, what did I what did I learn throughout this process? So there was the uh, self determination theory, which is evident throughout the entirety of the process. Um, being able to evaluate and and know how to do an approach. Uh, through the triad and how I was approached to the triad and how that made me feel was was also something that was great because it, it it really did was able to push me from the initial contemplation stage all the way down to the action stage where I'm at today um, and hopefully I'll be able to move that into that maintenance stage further on in the future um, self efficacy theory uh, as I stated those small steps got me got me each each piece of the way and, and then allowed self-endorsement. One of the first self-endorsement pieces was from Dr. Kim when she said, said, call yourself a doctor. Um, she was like Dr. Bass and I was like, oh, I don't know. And uh, I, I thought that was one of the, <laughs> the nicest thing, ways to push that on me. Um, um, yeah, so, so that's the basic model structures. So, so this uh, slide kind of represents closer to the end of the journey, which is look closely at the present you are constructing. It should look like the future you are dreaming. Um, Alice Walker talked about society doing this, but I was actually talking about the coaching program and, and a little bit of the representation there. Um, this program has allowed me to take a lot of skills uh, with me, uh, skills and things like leading conversations um, through reflection rather than questions. Um, and skills that I, I want to be able to pass on, on to, to future clients and, and give them the opportunities to have, have the same feelings I had when I went through and be able to start that behavioral change. So that's, uh, that's kind of that's the baseline <laughs> for, for me. So. Thank you so much, Solon. Sorry, I jumped the gun there. <laughs> uh, okay. the I, I know I was getting, I was, uh, yeah. It was I'm great. Like, it was great. Thank you so much. Sure. I would like to invite now Dr. Kimberly White Jethridge to um, present uh, her perspective. So Dr. Kim, as she's affectionately known, is a public health pediatrician at Meharry. She directs the Master of Science in Public Health program and is appointed as assistant professor both in public health and in clinical pediatrics. Um, she was one of the first Mary faculty to go through the Vanderbilt program and is a fully trained health coach. And she has been absolutely instrumental um, from day one in delivering this curriculum, refining this curriculum and mentoring students. So thanks for being here, Dr. Kim. Thank you and good morning. First, it is always a pleasure for me to be able to follow uh, someone like student Dr. Bass because it, it reminds us that there is hope in the future. And in these times, that is something that is very encouraging. One thing about uh, the Meharry students, um, as you heard about flipping the curriculum, Meharry didn't just flip the curriculum, we've learned how to flip the exam room. We know just from history and from science that only about 10% of uh, somebody's well-being has to do with healthcare, which means that our students are spending hundreds of thousands of dollars for 10% of anybody's health. But yet the 40% that is behavior and the 20% that has to go with social and environmental um, really can determine how well somebody does over the course of their life. And what health coaching does, it allows the, the student doctors and the physicians who are trained as health coaches to really interact with that rest of the person as a whole. And there are some characteristics that we all know of a good physician and they're characteristics of a good health coach or so. And somewhere in the middle of those two is what Meharry is training. And part of that has to do with this valuing wellness and not just health. And next slide, Ruth. Some of those major characteristics, one that I get to see when, when the students, the third years now, are coming through my clinical rotation in adolescent medicine is empathy and being an empathetic person or student doctor. And this takes the focus in moving away from the, I have to prove to you that I know that I'm an expert. 
which if all of us remember at some point of being a student is the, the need to pontificate and show people that I know what I'm talking about. Health coaching is different because it takes the students out and puts the patient back in the middle um, of that equation, which changes the dynamics of that power relationship. Next one. To be a good listener, I think that most everyone who has spoken so far has talked about the importance of listening. So often as physicians, we stand outside of the room, we review the chart or the EMR, and we make a diagnosis before we enter the room. And we spend the rest of the time listening for proof that we're right. And that is kind of the encounter. And at the end, you have your diagnosis, which you knew what it was before you got in the room and life is good. Health coaching changes that to actually stop and listen. And through that, we're able to change the diagnosis to actually something, because sometimes we miss things because we've already decided what it is before we get there. So changing that for the students to be able to uh, listen, to actually hear the patient and see what it is that is really uh, going on as far as the diagnosis. Next one relationships. We know that the patient, physician-patient relationship is key, and we also know that it tends to be very one-sided, all right? But with health coaching, the students are learning that, uh, that this is not so. I have my teenagers, and anyone who takes care of teenagers knows the deal with adolescents who come back to the clinic looking for their student doctor because they had such a wonderful encounter with them, someone who actually listened to them and worked that with them to put together their treatment plan. And that's something that you don't find too often. And it's just an amazing skill for these students. Next one. The students have the opportunity to inspire, and that means to work with the patient uh, to set up a goal, as you saw with student Dr. Bass, of where they wanna be in their life. They, how healthy do they want to be? Not how healthy do we as physicians want them to be, but hopefully it's somewhere in the middle there. And to work with them where they are to where they want to go. Um, and that's quite of a, a little bit of a, of a different slant on it also. Next one. Respectfulness. Um, being trained as a health coach teaches you permissive language and behavior, which allows you to relinquish control within the exam room. And just to ask those meaningful questions that um, Mark was saying that gets to the root of why, what might be causing a patient not to be able to uh, visualize their, their best health or so. The next one. And the opportunity to be positive. One thing coaches, uh, coaching teaches you is always to focus on the positives first instead of just trying to mitigate the negative how do we augment some of the positive and with that always being able to say things like so what are you most proud of with your health what have you successfully completed as far as your health plan since the last time i saw you and to do that with a teenager is something that is extremely powerful for them realizing that they do have some control of their life next slide and then humility this idea that you are not the expert in any one person's life. You have the medical knowledge, but you do not know what they bring into the exam room with them. And the skills that the students take in their medical toolbox from brainstorming. Uh, let's talk about how we might be able to um, improve your diet. Why don't you start with some ideas and to go back and forth and come up with a plan that the patient um, agrees with and sometimes has come up themselves is just awesome. With the same with the skill set of elicit provide elicit, which is another way of judging <clears throat> how much information the patient knows and how much more they're willing to kind of tolerate at that point, because sometimes it takes multiple visits to get somebody to where you want them to be with that knowledge base. So with that, just a real brief overview of some of the characteristics that I've observed with the third years that I went through coaching two years ago and how they are becoming just a complete new breed of physicians as they move forward and looking forward to as a fourth year uh, and also how they do as uh, when they go into residency and reminding them that because their colleagues when they start residency have not been trained like this, uh, it's going to be a little bit hard <laughs> because you're going to see things that you have learned to appreciate that other medical students or residents don't have. Um, and then they have the opportunity to share, share some of their knowledge. So that's just an overview done in true uh, 50 words a minute Boston style. <laughs> and I'll pass it over back to Ruth. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Kim. And finally, I'd like to introduce Dr. Regina Fodele, who is going to just give us for a couple of minutes an administrative perspective here. Dr. Fodele is the interim chair of the Department of Professional and Medical Education, and she also directs the SIM Lab. She's an associate professor at Meharry, did her medical training at UCLA, a um, general surgery residency at Drew King's and a breast fellowship at Stanford. So, Regina. So good morning. I'm going to, if you could just leave it at this one slide because I'm gonna okay. do everything from the slide. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I'm gonna give an administrative uh, perspective. The reason um, that we consider, the curriculum committee considers um, incorporating health coaching into our, our new curriculum uh, was because we were really focused on increasing the students overall interaction and communication skills, but also we were looking forward to um, improving our performance on, on the step, the National Board of Medical Examiner's Step 2 CS exam, which over the years we've been progressively increasing our performance, but we wanted to meet and surpass the national average. And so, and that was an important key for us to include this. Some of the things, the objectives that were, <coughs> excuse me, were from the curricular committee and were thinking about was that we wanted to provide a curriculum that would um, best prepare our students for the challenge of caring for the underserved and underpopulations that we typically care for. And so the health curriculum, the health coaching curriculum actually supported that. It allowed for the development of early effective communication skills. Um, skills to avoid potential physician bias, concepts that supported the restructuring. It also supported concepts that um, supported the restructuring of our uh, our clinics, which we're changing over to a patient-centered medical home um, model. And this um, model um, allows students to um, have a direct role in patient care. And so health, case, health coaching provided insight into behavioral change and, and, and in a way to improve um, patient outcomes. It was also um, anchored in different concepts, educational theory and concepts, and we were thinking about, you know, how um, we, the role of deliberate practice, which is also uh, a feature in health coaching because the students go over and over and over again in all three roles, how they can tweak and, and improve their overall skills. Concepts such as transfer learning, the key skills that they have developed in the health coaching course can transfer over into the clinical setting. Also things like metacognition, where the students are able to increase their critical thinking. Um, they also can, um, metacognition involves planning, um, monitoring and evaluating, and they do all these things in the context of the health coaching course. So in the broader view, all of the things that were mentioned prior by the other speakers were, were many of the reasons why we included um, and thought about including health coaching into our curriculum. And so really, and the really big impact was also um, that we initially wanted the students to be um, certified, but we had to take a step back and dial it back a bit because of the, the huge requirements that were involved in health coaching. So we changed it from a requirement to actually making it a, a, um, an option. And we do have students who are interested in moving forward and help in the um, certification process, even though it's no longer um, required. So I think that, I think in a, in a nutshell, those are the reasons why the, help, the curriculum committee and our um, evaluation of our new curriculum decided that it was a great idea to add health coaching to our curriculum because it provides all of the things that everyone talks about that are very useful in increasing communication skills for our students, increasing that doctor-patient relationship, and also allowing the, the students to have skills to facilitate the patient being an active participant in their healthcare, which we all know that if the patient is active in their healthcare decisions, and um, they were more likely to carry those decisions and those skills forward um, without the help of the help of the physician. So that's it in, my, in a nutshell. <laughs> Great. Thank Sorry. you so no, thank you so much, Dr. <coughs> Fodele. Appreciate your your being here.
So um, thank you all so much for your attention. And Peter, I, perhaps we have time for a couple of questions. Yeah, I just want to begin by saying um, that was such an inspiring and compelling and beautifully organized presentation. And I know that our leadership here at the Harvard Medical School and hopefully other medical schools around the country are going to hear this and, and, uh, and continue to explore how we can integrate these sorts of important initiatives within the training of our healthcare providers. So thank you so much. I, I do have one question. Um, and I, I'm going to bring this in from the sort of research perspective, but um, among the many things that that seems to benefit from this is the well-being of your student physicians like Salon. And, um, and we all know that the well-being of physicians in training, any healthcare provider training in our university, even medical researchers in training um, that are going through our master's and PhD programs and our uh, doctoral programs, go through a great deal of stress. Um, there's tremendous amounts of anxiety, depression, burnout, and that impacts their well-being as well as their progression um, as um, providers and researchers. I'm wondering, as you pan out, not just from your program, but from your knowledge, Ruth, um, and maybe others, um, are there some good examples of how a health coaching program has been integrated into uh, the curriculum uh, and what are the quantitative outcomes that, that support uh, its benefits to well-being and completion of programs and, and lifelong learning? skills. Thank you so much. So I think, so there certainly are a number of mindfulness programs that are um, being incorporated throughout medical schools. And we have a running mindfulness training throughout this. Um, it's a very applied. And so we're not doing, you know, the recommendation of a 45 minute a day practice. We're doing very short um, practices. We're doing 10 to 15 minute practices and giving students lots of resources. And what we end up <clears throat> hearing, um, people select what they're most ready for. So we do see um, uptake on mindfulness. We have ourselves have not measured that, but there certainly is excellent data for that um, in the medical school population and across provider, um, the provider population in general. Um, the other thing I would say is that the unique thing about the health coaching is because people are selecting things that they need to work on um, per their own perception, um, well-being looks really different for different people. So this year, for example, we had a number of people choose in their personal change projects to do things, uh, to, to set target goals, umbrella goals that were more about maintaining the social relationships because the students were very isolated, you know, everybody working from their, their home. And if they weren't, didn't have a, a family like Dr. student Dr. Bass has, um, you know, they may have felt even more isolated. We certainly heard a lot about that. So I think um, measuring that potential change in social isolation and having a control group to compare it against would be very important. Um, well-being, um, the stress as a kind of buffer to burnout. And then I think the other thing that would be very useful to measure is something about the, um, the thriving, the, the, about thriving, particularly about utilizing strengths and leveraging strengths and starting to take a positive frame. The whole course helps people do that, um, but we've not measured it. What we do hear from students a lot is about the intense workload, which of course medical school is. Um, we have significantly decreased the amount that we're asking for from students and we don't have it right yet. I think we have the modules right now. Um, that has come down a lot, but it's still unclear the um, amount of practice that, that people need. And, and that's something that we're continuing to get feedback on the students from. Great. Well, I know we're running out of time and I wish we can um, extend this and maybe we'll have you come back. I know that there is a wealth of data um, beyond just um, the training of medical students showing that if you integrate health coaching into primary care settings or other uh, medical settings that you do change patient-centered outcomes in significant ways as well, as well as costs. Um, we'll have to leave it at that because I know um, those of you interested should really look at the work that Ruth and her colleagues have done, and she's been a leader in, in 
synthesizing these um, evidence-based approaches. So um, as we finish up, I wanna again, thank our speakers um, for such a great presentation. I wanna thank our audience for coming. And just a couple quick announcements. Um, typically we have our uh, grand rounds um, the first Tuesday of every month, and that will continue except next month is election day. And so we're not gonna hold that. And partly, uh, more in large part because November 6th is our biannual uh, network forum and we encourage people to use their time for this kind of education that week uh, to join us for what promises to be a really rich day uh, related to integrative medicine and, and education. Um, and there's a link to register for this event on our website. You can also look uh, under the chat. There's a link that will take you directly there. We hope you'll consider that. And then following that uh, in December, we have a really fascinating presentation on um, pain perception. Uh, it's gonna be Dr. Christian Bouchel from uh, Hamburg area. He's gonna be talking about pain and pain regulation from the spinal to the cortical, from spinal cord to the cortical processing system. So once again, thank you all. I wish you all well, and I uh, hope to see you guys at our future events. And thank you again for all our speakers. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you.